So um, as you've seen, this is going to be recorded and posted on our ON YouTube channel just for posterity. So there will be hopefully some time for questions at the end. If you can just put your questions in the chat, I will read them out to Dr. Allen. And I would like to uh, kick this off by introducing my good friend and colleague, Dr. Samantha Allen. We met in the Fish Path Lab, lab many, many years ago at the University of Guelph, uh, where Sam was working prior to starting her master's degree with Dr. Claire Jardine, looking at antimicrobial resistance genes in small wild mammals around sort of different types of land use. She then got her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine uh, at Ontario Veterinary College, and she had quite a diverse career. So she did some emergency and small animal practice. She was a veterinarian for Chicken Farmers of Ontario, where she managed the 2015 high path avian influenza outbreak. And then she worked in the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs as a regional veterinarian in the abattoirs before she decided to return to Dr. Jardine's lab to do a PhD. So her PhD was looking at the ecology of two vector-borne diseases, blue tongue and epizootic hemorrhagic disease viruses in wild and domestic ruminants. Once she was finished her PhD, she left Canada to pursue a wildlife dream job in Wyoming. So she brings her diverse background to the state wildlife veterinarian role, as well as her passion for teaching vet students. And she gets to live her dream of developing field capture techniques while also combating chronic wasting disease and brucellosis not to mention Kanye West also wanting to build a concert amphitheater in endangered sage grouse breeding habitat. And with that, I'm going to mute and turn it over to Sam, who's got a very exciting talk for us today. Thank you, Alex. And I'm going to attempt to do this again. Do I have to flip it? What am I sharing? I'm not sharing anything yet. Do do do. Are folks seeing my notes? Yes, we can see your notes. There you go. There we go. Okay. So I'm just going to do this so I can also maybe see my face for two seconds. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, if you think you've joined the wrong group, brucellosis and CWD is going to be the topic today. You will have a couple of chances of escaping, but this is the first one, so I'm warning you. Um, Alex, it's such a nice job of introducing me, but I have this slide in here, so I'll go over it real fast. Uh, my name is Sam Allen. I did a master's DVM and PhD at the University of Guelph. I do like talking to folks from Ontario because when I say the word Guelph, you don't think I'm clearing my throat. So that's kind of one of the bonuses today. Um, my position right now is of state wildlife veterinarian for Wyoming. I'm also the branch supervisor for our veterinary services unit here in Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And I am adjunct faculty at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Veterinary Sciences. And these two pictures on here are showing you two of my favorite wild creatures to work on, one being a little bit smaller, the raccoon, um, and then one being pretty large, um, our moose. I'm gonna give a few slides to our veterinary services unit because they're a group of amazing people. And I think this is a pretty special thing um, that we have here in Wyoming Game and Fish. Uh, we have our veterinary services unit and our main focus is to look on wildlife health disease and immobilization for the state of Wyoming. We do that through four prongs um, using diagnostics, information, education, and research. And we do a lot of research primarily on infectious diseases, but other fun things too. Uh, CWD and brucellosis are some of the bigger ones that we're looking at. Surprise, surprise, considering the title of the talk here. We do also look a lot at bighorn sheep pneumonia and those pathogen complexes, um, West Nile virus, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus 2, high path AI, and a bunch of other weird and wonderful pathogens. Um, we also do a lot of research work on pharmaceuticals and different drugs and how they work or don't work on a number of our free ranging species. And then our last thing that we really focus on is what I call field tech and welfare implications. Um, this is everything to do with, even though we can, should we? Um, this ties a lot with using collars and implants and ear tags and et cetera. This comes down a lot to how we handle animals and how we work with them. So a lot of the work that we also do centers around this kind of key area too. Now our veterinary services unit is split into kind of two sub units. We have our wildlife health lab. Um, this lab is looking primarily at diagnostics. Um, again, surprise, surprise, brucellosis and CWD are some of the bigger ones that we do work on. 
However, closely followed is our bighorn sheep pneumonia complex work. And again, our weird and wonderful. Um, we do have diagnostic capability for things like rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus too. Um, our lovely Orbeez Eliophora, which is a parasite in moose, and then M. bovis in our pronghorn. Um, we do test over 15,000 samples annually. A lot of that is first chronic wasting disease. We are accredited yearly through NOMS. And for you folks kind of up there that might not recognize this acronym, that's just kind of their version kind of of CFIA. So it's one of the major federal labs down here. And then the research in this lab centers mainly around molecular testing improvements and validation. For you folks that work mainly with wildlife, it is always such a, you know, a great thing to get samples brought to you so you can test them. But I'm sure you realize that they come in many different formats, sometimes in a glove, sometimes well sealed in a tube. Sometimes they've been left outside for many, many days. So a lot of work that we do is trying to make sure these samples, because we can get them and we're grateful for them, can we make them work for us um, in many different ways. The photo I have on this slide, and I didn't really introduce to you on the last one, is how bighorn sheep come to us when we're doing a lot of our testing. Um, I cannot climb a mountain the same way that they can. You know, that's a fun fact about me. Uh, but this is kind of an easy way that we can get our samples and check on the health of these animals. Um, I affectionately call them bighorn sheep burritos. The other subunit in our veterinary services group is our Tom Thorne and Beth Williams Wildlife Research Center. This center houses around 50 native captive animals. Historically, the center was the captive breeding facility for the black-footed ferret program and the Wyoming toad program. These are two species that were kind of on the brink of extinction and they were brought back through these historical programs. Right now, we primarily research chronic wasting disease. Again, surprise, surprise. Um, this is where our vaccine trials have happened. A lot of our genetic and shedding trials happen here. We do have a composting project that's starting up that will be very interesting to see how that goes. And again, when it comes to kind of the pharmaceutical drug side or that kind of welfare and field tech side, a lot of that work happens here as well. So one of the projects in particular is looking at pronghorn fawns and the use of GPS collars. Can we do that more effectively? Are we doing that well now? Um, on this slide, I do have a picture of Beth Williams. If you are cool like me and you spend Friday nights Googling things like, what does Riz mean? Um, I think Tom Thorne and Beth Williams also deserve a bit of a Google as well. Um, they were titans in the wildlife disease world. I won't spoil it for you, um, but there are reasons why we've named our facility after these two individuals. Also on this slide, we have one of our captive bighorn sheep. Uh, they really don't respect boundaries as you can see in this photo here. And this slide is just to show everyone that I really don't do all of this work on my own that I'm gonna show you. I, very, I do very little now, I feel, other than sit in this chair. Um, these are the folks that are doing all this work on the ground and making all the magic happen. As they say, they are incredibly passionate. We are incredibly lucky um, as a state to have people like this in our group. All right, so as a quick reminder, what is in store today? We are going to talk about brucellosis and we are gonna talk about chronic wasting disease. I'm gonna be a bit of a bummer um, and I will point out when I'm exceptionally being a bummer, but that's just kind of how it is with some of these disease programs. I'm gonna try and focus a bit on our surveillance and testing. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about feed grounds um, because I don't think everyone has a setup like this. Um, and there's only one way to understand why brucellosis is the way it kind of is, and that's going through our feed ground system. So why does wildlife disease matter? Um, sometimes I might come on a bit too strong because I do really have a passion for wildlife infectious disease. So I think people just think I'm a little different. Um, and the only reason why I care about wildlife disease is because I just find it so fascinating fascinating. There are way more reasons than just kind of my neuroses to want to care, to do surveillance programs, to monitor and track the spread and prevalence of wildlife disease. Um, really, the way I want you folks to think about it is there's all these kind of points I have on here, but you want to think, how does this impact how folks live and then how folks make a living? So those are kind of the two kind of sides to it. But 
The first major thing in here is because I'm a veterinarian, I always think about wildlife health and welfare. And this is particularly looking at the individual animal. When we talk about wildlife, we don't necessarily, you know, always think about that individual animal, but this is definitely important, especially if that's where your lens lies. Um, and a lot of these diseases can be pretty debilitating. So we do care about it because of that animal on the landscape. The other reason on here is that long-term population health as well. So we care about the animal. We also care about the larger uh, lens too, right? So how are populations doing long-term on the grand scheme? A lot of folks care because of spillover to wildlife and especially domestic species. So you'll tend to see, you know, some diseases rise at priority list and some kind of fall down. And sometimes that's hard to understand why. Um, but if there is kind of that spillover between wildlife and domestic, it tends to get a little more priority. Human health is one of those other ones that raises it up a little bit again. So that zoonotic disease aspect of it makes it really important to care about wildlife disease. And then finally, we kind of have what I, again, calling kind of our weird and wonderful, but economic and cultural impacts in there. Those also really matter. And that's why we should care about wildlife disease. We have regulatory and management objectives, but we also have folks that use subsistence harvest um, and other kind of aspects to there. This can directly impact a bunch of different people. So when I'm talking about brucellosis, I'm gonna talk about brucella abortus here. Um, Ontario, you folks have B. suis um, and we have B. abortus. So same group, just kind of different. This is a bacterial disease of elk and bison and of domestic cattle. And really what you're thinking about here is abortions and infertility. This is transmitted through contact with abortions and stillbirth and any kind of associated fluids or tissues with that kind of reproductive cycle. When we think of clinical signs, um, typically you, you won't be able to tell if you're looking at just like a free ranging elk out on the landscape. However, um, once abortions start happening, it's pretty you know easy to pick who had B. abortus and who did not. And this is typically occurring in our third trimester. The other thing people talk about are these hygromas. Um, just anecdotally, I don't really see that as much here with B. abortus and elk as folks do back home in kind of caribou with B. suis. But when we're talking about hygromas, we're talking about kind of pockets of fluid or it looks a bit like a growth, typically in the joint areas on that front limb of these animals. We have estimated around, and I'm going to use the royal we a lot as we're going through here. So I probably didn't do all this work, but you know I'm here, so I use the we. Um, but an 82% abortion rate of first calves in bison, and at about 61% for elk. And then I'm throwing this on the slide because everyone always asks about it. So I might be taking someone's question away, but vaccination in cattle generally prevents disease, so it's generally pretty successful. This has not been successful or effective in elk. Um, if anyone ever wants to talk more about all the work that Game and Fish has done or did to try and come up with a vaccine, you're welcome to do so, but I require a beer prior to this conversation. Now, coming to the why do we care, right? Because that's something we definitely have to think about before we endeavor to do any of these programs. Um, one is again that costly side so you know we talked about economic and cultural impact so that's a big one with brucellosis so on the domestic animal side we definitely have decreased milk production we have loss of young infertility lameness and we can have transmission to other livestock horses is one we don't tend to think about but there's a cost there too overall there's a lot of money involved in testing and surveillance so it's a very costly um, thing to have to deal with which is why you know we tend to do some of the surveillance animal welfare is another one on there remember we talked about you know that individual animal component be it domestic or wild there can be weight loss loss of young infertility and lameness and we do care about that because it can be debilitating in some ways the federal state program aspect of this, so we care because sometimes we're told to care. So we will talk about that brucellosis eradication program, but we also have a lot of these programs because we're trying to avoid creating a wildlife reservoir. And then finally, that zoonotic disease side or the human health side, um, this is definitely one we care about because there can be human health impacts. 
So, you know, I touched on zoonoses really quickly and you're like, well, Sam, I am assuming people still hunt elk out there. Um, they definitely do. It's just that when we talk about zoonotic disease, I just wanted to quickly kind of offshoot and just talk about low and high risks out here. There are low risks during hunting seasons um, because they tend to run until mid and Jan or January in some areas. And we tend to consider bacteria not being active in that time, even though it can be found in the bursa and the repro lymph nodes. It's normally not found in meat and it is easily killed by cooking. So there's a lot of kind of these like low risk periods. The risks definitely do increase after February 1st because we're hitting that third trimester of pregnancy for our free ranging elk. Um, and the fetus and associated fluids are full of what we're now considering active bacteria. But continuing along our story and brucellosis, um, we're gonna talk about history a little bit now. So if you wanna zone out for a couple of slides, I wouldn't blame you. But brucellosis was first isolated in the US in the 1910, and it was then introduced into the GYA or Greater Yellowstone area around the Civil War. And this was through domestic cattle brought over here. Um, it was then detected in bison in 1917, and then in our elk in 1930. In 1934, here's where kind of our caring for programs comes in, but a cooperative state federal brucellosis eradication program was initiated. And this was generally just to try and rid the USA of any B abortus that was found anywhere. Um, it was deemed generally successful. The only problem being that we did have a remaining reservoir population in our wildlife species in the GYA. So other than the GYA, um, it was eradicated elsewhere. The challenge now for Wyoming is trying to maintain this brucellosis free status, um, which they do maintain. And this is even with having kind of herds exposed each year, about 2.6 in our domestic cattle and bison, um, primarily transmitted from our free ranging elk. So now you're thinking, Sam, you just told us there is exposure in Wyoming about every year to some of our domestic herds, yet Wyoming still maintains this brucellosis free status. And you are right, it is kind of counterintuitive, especially with our GYA area, right, that is now serving as our last disease reservoir for this bacterium. Um, but since we can't get rid of it, because now it's in a wildlife reservoir and that's hard to do, we don't want to let states like Wyoming not have the same economic opportunity that other folks have. Um, so they came up with this management tool, and I'm calling it a management tool. You know, other regulatory folks might deem it something else, um, but it's called the Designated Surveillance Area, or, you know, affectionately called the DSA. And this was established in 2010. So this DSA is gonna lump part of the states into a special operating sector and those special operating sector comes with restrictions. So think of this as an administrative boundary to manage and monitor the disease in domestic animals. I'm now gonna go through these maps with you. You're gonna see a lot of these maps today. If I run through them too quickly, all of these are found online. So again, you know, the Friday night Google and things. This is something you can also look up if you really want to. So our first map here, and I hope you can see my arrow on the left, this is of Wyoming. Wyoming is a square. It's very easy to draw and give people directions if you need to. Uh, up here, kind of in the northwest, the most northwest, we have this kind of blob in green. That's Yellowstone Park. I think most folks kind of know what that is, so I like to point that out first. And then we're going to follow this red line around here. This is our DSA. So this is our kind of boundary that is put into the state that allows Wyoming to maintain that brucellosis free status, um, but also it comes with some restrictions. All of these little kind of lines in here with the numbers in there, just so folks know, um, these are our hunt areas for elk. So it's just kind of giving you an idea of how that's broken down. Ignore these colors right now. We will talk about that in a second. The last map on the slide I wanna show you is this one by USDA. And it's mainly just to say, this isn't kind of just a Wyoming thing. There are two other states that also have a DSA. You can see that red kind of continues out. Um, Idaho and Montana, also kind of part of the fun. And it's tied around right to our greater Yellowstone area, which is our, again, last remaining reservoir of this disease. So, 
this is kind of an expansion on what we talked about in the last slide on, you know, the DSA and just to give you an idea of what one of some of those restrictions are. So we have the DSA right for early detection and high risk herds. And what are we kind of doing in the domestic animal side? Well, we're having movement restrictions in some cases. We're having increased testing in some cases, the vaccine RB51 in some cases and quarantine exposed herds in cases as well, right? So we're trying to provide, you know, increasing our ability to detect things um, and trying to limit risk to the rest of the state. And this is on here just to give you an idea. This was February 9th of this year. Um, there are, you know, impacted herds with bru brucellosis that continue every year. So it's not just me out here making stuff up as we go along. This one let us know that there were two brucellosis affected herds within Wyoming's DSA and we're using harsh winter weather conditions kind of as the reason because it increased commingling between wildlife and livestock. So now we've learned about the DSA, now we're going to look, learn about kind of a second tool um, to help with brucellosis management in the state. Initially these weren't um, used as a tool for brucellosis and you'll kind of see as they've evolved through time. Now, what is a feed ground? So a feed ground is a place where elk are fed over the winter. Um, in 1908 in Jackson Hole, which is again in that kind of Northwest part of the state that I showed you before, uh, hundreds of elk died from starvation. So the thought process there was, how do we keep these elk from starving? Let's develop a way that we can feed them over the winter. Um, I'm gonna keep sarcasm to myself because I wasn't alive then. Um, I, I look too good to be over a hundred um, for that to have happened. But um, a lot of this is tied to building in areas um, that were winter range habitat for these elk, right? So we're kind of taking some of that away. Any hoodle. In 1912, um, the National Elk Refuge was kind of built, started feeding elk there. In 1929, um, Game and Fish started feeding on three more feed grounds to reduce starvation events again, right? Because they're working well. So we're trying to keep elk alive. We don't want them to die. So the thought process there is too, we're going to feed some elk. Also in the same time, the state passed a law authorizing that folks could file a claim against the state for damage to property by game animals like elk. So you're starting to kind of see that evolution of feed grounds. We started with, we don't want elk to die on the landscape. And now potentially they're being used as a good tool to keep elk from getting themselves into trouble on private landowners land. In 1970s, the final feed ground was established. To date today, you know, in 2024, we have 21, and I'll put a little star on that, but um, operated feed grounds in addition to the NER and about 15 to 16,000 elk are fed annually. About 70 to 160 days is the length of season. This really depends though, depends on winter condition, location, and the elk condition as well. So just a quick summary on why feeding is happening. And through my sarcasm, you probably picked some of this up already, but starvation was the main reason initially. It went on to damage, right? Trying to avoid some of those difficult situations that elk find themselves in. And then the third one on here, you know, as stuff really evolved, was that reducing commingling um, between domestic animals and free ranging elk and the risk and spread of brucellosis. So it's kind of evolved from where it was initially. It's grown from here too, though. Um, a lot of folks like feed grounds because it assists with the maintenance of elk populations. So for many reasons there, and it also can help with reducing competition for forage with other species too, like mule deer, again, because of some of that habitat loss, um, there is some competition there as well. And it kind of takes some of that off of mule deer. So Again, we are in the northwest part of the state, um, and this is where our elk feed grounds are located. So um, those black stars here are showing you where each one of them are. This is Jackson Hole, and this is you know the original NER um, feed ground there. There are rules and regulations tied to feed grounds. Um, these are some of the bigger ones, uh, one being if you wanted to have temporary emergency feeding, one of the regional commissioners have to approve that. Um, as we talked about in 1929, state law does require 
uh, Wyoming Game and Fish to compensate landowners for any damage to crops by big game animals. Um, any new feed ground requires commission approval. So that's something that would have to happen prior to developing a new one. And this is kind of new, uh, but closing a feed ground now requires governor approval. So this was kind of taken out of commissioner's hands here and brought higher up to the governor. And just quickly for folks that don't really know what a commission is, and I think everyone might do stuff a little differently, but the commission here for Game and Fish is a policy making board. Um, they're responsible for the direction and supervision of the director of Game and Fish. Uh, there's seven members appointed by the governor for a six year term and not more than five members shall be of the same party. I, I really like throwing that out there because I think about that a lot being in a place like Wyoming. Um, one of the other parts here is, you know, I've talked a lot about Wyoming Game and Fish, but there are multiple folks that um, are part of this kind of feed ground world. Uh, U.S. Forest Service is one of them. The Bureau of Land Management is another. U.S. Fish and Wildlife. There are private landowners that allow some of that land um, to be converted for use for some of these feed grounds. Um, Office of State Land and Investments, Wyoming Game and Fish Commission, as you saw in the previous slide. And there are many others that can be involved in this indirectly. Um, certain folks can benefit from these seed, feed grounds and other folks do not. So there's a lot of different people involved with this system. And as far as management goes for these feed grounds, because that's a question that comes up a lot too. Uh, initially, there was a brucellosis feed ground habitat program that went on for a little while. This is really where a lot of the research and work on, you know, how to feed grounds work, how to brucellosis in elk work. Um, so elk vaccination program, the test and slaughter program and low density feeding, this all came out of this. Uh, habitat enhancements, when and how to get them off of the feed grounds ASAP, how separation can help as far as that brucellosis spread goes with elk and cattle and a lot of education. Um, this program was disbanded in 2017, even though a lot of these items are still being done, just maybe not you know, with a clear direction in a lot of cases, unfortunately. There was a newly approved feed ground management plan that came into play in March of this year. So this is one of these things where you know, we'll probably see where management goes in these cases. And just a quick kind of conclusion on brucellosis and feed grounds before I go into surveillance and testing in the state. Um, it is a bit of a dichotomy, right? Because we have feed grounds that perpetuate the abortus while it does limit transmission to livestock. Our feed ground elk average about 25 to 30% seroprevalence. Uh, our bison at the NER is about 65% it really doesn't appear to be population limiting in wildlife at this point, but we also feed um, our elk. So I think we're a little biased in that regard a little bit. It can cause about a 15% reduction in calf population. So take that what you will, um, whether you think it's a lot or not a lot. Disease maintenance happens on feed grounds is just how it is. We have a peak transmission of this bacteria overlapping with elk congregation on feed grounds in early spring. So it's just a really good way to keep uh, brucellosis spread in these elk populations. Um, in some cases, brucellosis persists in the absence of feed grounds though. So I'm trying to give a little both sides of this. In general, you just really don't want a wildlife reservoir when it comes to certain diseases. So the surveillance in Wyoming is three pronged and I will show you another one of those fun maps. So I don't expect you to try and like pull that um, from a few slides ago, but just to go over this before you are bombarded by color. Um, the first prong of our surveillance is looking annually at elk herds around the DSA. So these are from hunter harvested samples and these are non feed ground elk. So we're really trying to get an idea of anything that borders that DSA, is anything escaping and can we pick up on it? The second prong on here is our rotational surveillance and that occurs in a quarter of the hunt areas outside of the DSA. So now we're talking, you know, away from the Northwest, um, we're talking, you know, everywhere else. And then we rotate these areas to try and again, pick up if anything is escaping outside the DSA. And this is also on hunter harvested animals and non feed ground elk as well. 
And then the last prong on here is our surveillance that occurs on feed grounds. We do rotate um, between four to six feed grounds a year, and we do sample animals on these feed grounds. Um, these can be, again, hunter harvested, found dead animals, or typically these are live animals um, that we sample on the feed grounds. So here's another one of these fun maps, and I told you there'd be a lot of color, but just to going over what I said before, we have our three prongs. We have our annual surveillance, that is this yellow area here. So we're trying to hit areas that are bordering the DSA, and these are hunter harvested non-feed ground elk. We have our rotation of surveillance. Um, this is occurring in the other parts of the state, and it kind of goes year to year depending where we go. So in 2024, we're gonna be down in this green area here. Um, and this is again in hunter harvested, non feed ground elk. And then in this area here, we do have our kind of feed ground surveillance as well. So those are our three prongs. This is found online again, if you do wanna look this up again. As far as testing is concerned, um, all the tests do happen within our wildlife health lab. We look for exposure to brucellosis, so we're not looking for true pathogen here, and we do use whole blood as the tissue that we would like. Kits are put together and then mailed to hunters. Um, so this program is 100% kind of through the mail. Typically, we do get samples brought to the office too, um, but we try to set it up to make it as easy as possible. We typically send out around 9,000 kits a year, and these are based on, again, on our rotational surveillance. This is based on priorities and, again, capacity for the lab. Sometimes we do forget we have people running these samples, so we need to make sure that we're also not making them cry every day. The testing that we use is a fluorescence polarization assay. This is an FPA, and we do um, the plate test. This is just to screen all of our samples. And then if we do have a seropositive, we follow up with a tube test. This is the confirmation. If anyone has a question for me about the FPA, I'm not that gal, okay? You know that slide I showed you before with the also amazing people that do all that stuff? They are the folks. So if there's something in particular there, like very specific, um, please let me know later and we can get that answered for you. If there's anything funky, um, you know, outside of what we would expect, outside of the areas we would expect, we do send these off um, to a federal lab for confirmation. And, you know, I talked about research that our lab does and et cetera, et cetera. But this paper I just have on this slide here is a really good example um, of using something that most folks kind of throw in the trash, uh, hemolyzed blood samples uh, to augment and increase our surveillance capacities in the state. And as for distribution, um, so again, we have our square, which is Wyoming. We have Yellowstone up here. Um, and here's our red DSA. So you folks are all experts now. Um, we have our brucellosis endemic area, which is in yellow. So you can see that, you know, yellow area here. And then we have our brucellosis exposure areas, which are spotted, kind of these areas here. And mainly the big difference um, is more terminology than anything, but our areas in yellow are ones that we're frequently detecting uh, or detecting seropositive animals and our ones kind of spotted are more one-offs, maybe once every five years. Okay, so we talked about brucellosis, we talked about why wildlife disease is important, um, and you saw a really cute picture of a raccoon. So now let's talk about chronic wasting disease. So there's going to be a few slides here that I feel like I'm legally obligated to give because I'm not sure everyone's background on CWD. If you've never heard of CWD before, I'm so excited for you. But now I'm sad for you because I'm going to make your day just a little bit sadder. Um, chronic wasting disease or CWD is a progressive, fatal and untreatable nervous system disease of white-tailed deer, mule deer, elk, moose, reindeer, and caribou. It is an infectious protein. It's not a bacteria. It's not a virus. Um, and it is called a prion. Similar family as BSC, Scrapie, Kurtzfeld-Jakob, um, or Kuru, and the transmission in this case can be animal to animal, environment to animal. Um, these prions can live in the environment for a very long time. So let's take Scrapie, for example, um, 16 plus years. Now, what is a prion? Um, I'm gonna use my chair analogy, which everyone makes fun of me for here, but um, 
I like to talk about it, so that's what we're gonna do. So we have our kind of normal proteins living in our nervous system. I want you to think of those normal proteins as one of those fun folding chairs that you would use to play card games with your grandparents. Um, it's a very useful chair, similar to this very useful protein. You can sit in it, it brings you joy for whatever reason, um, and it's easy to break. So I want you to think about that too. If you had a violent streak in you, you wanted to wrestle for some reason, um, it's one of those chairs that you could break it a little bit easier. Now the challenge is with prions um, and CWD is you've now taken this normal protein and it's now changed into this abnormal um, shape. So think of your folding chair is now folded up. This chair is useless to you now. Um, you could probably still sit in it, but it wouldn't be very comfortable. And if you wanted to break it or run it over or whatever, um, it's very difficult to do so now. So that is your chair analogy. Sorry for that. Um, but really what a protein is, is a normal protein shaped to an abnormal protein. It becomes infectious, it becomes transmissible, and it's really difficult to get rid of. This can happen spontaneously or they can be infected. So we talked about transmission in the last slide. It can, you know, come somewhere else. That altered shape that we talked about allows binding to other proteins. Um, it can induce their shape to change and then you get a spread and clumping occurs. And all of a sudden you have all of these rafts and clumps built up in a nervous system and it causes death and destruction to a bunch of other cells and tissues in there. And all that death and destruction leads to what we see, um, you know, in the worst period of CWD, which is at the last four to eight weeks. Typically that time frame for that, again, death and destruction can really vary. So we call that our incubation period. It can take about 1.5 to four years. Um, that can really vary between, you know, deer or elk or et cetera, um, what kind of genotype they have. There can be no obvious clinical signs during that incubation period. So um, as kind of a example, the vast majority of hunters, when we did call to give CWD results, uh, we would tell them it would be positive and they just couldn't believe it. It was like a no way moment for them. So it's not easy. Um, and I would say people cannot pick up on it really early on in the course of disease. At that end stage, about four to eight weeks, you'll tend to see weight loss, drooling, behavioral changes. There can be hair coat changes, droopy ears, just a general lack of awareness um, and what we kind of, you know, call drug malfunctions down here. Drugs don't work as well as they should when we're talking about our terminal elk um, at our captive research facility. Uh, if I was there in person, I would do a really fun game where I'd like point to someone in the crowd and be like, tell me in these pictures, which one has CWD and which one does not. And then, you know, someone would tell me 65 over here, this sad looking elk. And I'd go, ha ha, I fooled you. They both had CWD. Um, so again, it's just reinforcing uh, that you really can't tell, especially early on. As far as distribution goes, um, CWD is found in other parts of the world as well, but you know, we're giving a talk in Ontario, so that's really what I'm focusing on here. Um, you know, I told you I'd be a bit of a bummer, and man, is this map such a bummer. Um, the USGS does an excellent job at putting these maps together, but I get sadder and sadder every time they put this out. This is mainly to show you that, you know, it started in Colorado and Wyoming and it's gone from there uh, and it has not stopped from there. So it is found in many different states and many different provinces at this point. As far as some of the epi goes here, um, you know, folks do talk a lot about sex and age linkage with CWD and higher prevalence being in males when it comes to mule deer um, and white-tailed deer. Same, oh, not same, but with elk, it's equally distributed between bulls and cows, um, and it's typical in more prime-aged animals. When we're talking about genetics, uh, genetics can potentially influence the length of time animals survive once they're infected with CWD. But most elk in particular, because that's what we tend to work with more here at our facility, die within 2.5 and four years. There has never been a true resistance identified. There is no documented immunity or recovery and all cervids are susceptible. So I do get emails every once in a while with people being like, but you just haven't tried this vitamin yet. Let me tell you, we got some fat elk at that facility and they're treated really well and they all get CWD and they all die. So I just, you know, I'm trying again not to be a huge bummer, but I'm also trying to help you out if you do deal um, with some of that from the public or other folks that you work with.
As far as the history and distribution in Wyoming, there is an unknown origin or date of establishment. There was a modeling paper out that suggested though that CWD was present since the 1950s. It was first documented in free range and mule deer in 1985, in elk in 1986, and white tailed deer in 1990, and then the only case um, in the moose in 2008. And this all started in the southeast corner of the state. So it's kind of a mirror um, to what we talked about before, brucellosis being at that northwest part. Now we're talking about a disease that kind of started in the southeast portion. Um, I'm going to show my age probably a little bit. These next three slides um, are just kind of demonstrate, you know, where chronic wasting started, where it went. Um, there used to be a show where they traumatized children and take them to prisons and say, if you don't eat carrots and finish your algebra homework, you're going to end up in prison. Um, my hope is not to really scare folks that much, but I do think if you do work with people or you're in charge of a program or even like on the edge of it, there are really good reasons to be concerned. There are really good reasons to want to invest and try to do as good a surveillance as you can, um, because you'll see in a second, uh, it's not going to fix itself on its own. So again, we have Wyoming, we have our square. Um, we're talking here CWD prevalence. So the higher we go, the darker red we are. So in this map, we're going to look at disease density in Wyoming deer from 1998 to 2005. And you can see in the southeastern part of the state, this is where the highest concentration is a CWD. And we get really dense in here. So this is where our highest prevalence is um, at that time. And then in deer from 2006 to 2023, now you can see we spread out a little bit more. Um, we still have that higher prevalence right in the southeast part of the state, but we've kind of gone north kind of gone a little west, we've gone a little central, um, and we're getting some more very concentrated areas in different parts of the state as well. When it comes to elk, um, and we'll talk about our surveillance in a second, our elk surveillance program um, initially wasn't as robust as our deer one was, but I think we're picking up and catching up quite a bit. Um, but this is from 2006 to 2023. You'll see again, um, this is where kind of our concentration is in the southeast part of the state. And again, we're kind of going up and moving over to a side and we're developing certain concentrations in other areas as well. And just as kind of a quick aside, because we talked about feed grounds, you're now experts on them. Um, this is definitely something that does keep me up at night. Uh, when we talk about feed grounds in the state right now, we have not detected a CWD positive animal on any of the feed grounds on this point. Um, we do realize it's going to be pretty much impossible to eradicate CWD once it's established on feed grounds, you know, based on everything we have right now, as far as technology and science goes. Uh, there have been, a ton, well, not a ton, but a handful of modeling papers and white pages that talk about how when CWD hits a feed round, it's going to be really um, more likely to decrease the population over the long term, right? Like it's not going to help populations do good long term. Um, we do believe that these feed grounds will become hotspots for CWD transmission. And the worry isn't just elk to elk. The other worry is between elk and other species or other species that then leave to other species. So there's a lot of concerns there. We're not sure how quickly CWD prevalence will increase once on feed grounds. Um, it's unknown how or if hunting demand will change if that starts happening. And it's really unknown how feed grounds will impact the distribution and prevalence overall. However, I think we know it probably won't be very positive. One of the other reasons that stuff keeps me up at night, or maybe why I have an extra glass of wine, um, is we have found five positive elk and seven positive deer in the past three years like on, in those areas. So they're definitely knocking at the door, um, even if we haven't found a positive, you know, directly on a feed ground. As far as management goes, because um, people ask this all the time, what are you folks doing? Well, um, one of it was there was a CWD management plan that was approved in 2021. There was that feed ground management plan that was approved this year that does have a CWD management section in that tied to feed grounds. There are baiting rules and regs, there are feeding rules and regs, there are disposal and transport rules and regs. We have increased and refined surveillance, um, and this isn't 
me, right? This is a lot of folks tied into a lot of this work together, um, but, you know, identifying priority and mandatory areas. We've increased lab testing capacity. We've brought RT Quick on in our group. Um, and a little star here, we've brought it on for research purposes, not for our surveillance program I'm going to talk about in a little bit. We've increased research capacity. We work with a ton of folks internally and externally, um, be it other, you know, government groups, doesn't matter what level, um, and other university and research groups on vaccine trials, composting work, shedding studies, genotypic work, anti-mortem sampling, do migratory routes play a role, mineral licks, transmission, hunting impacts on prevalence, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge for Wyoming right now is we are still having difficulty getting the public on board for management level research things. Like, can we eliminate hot spots in certain areas? Can we change some of our hunting seasons or how hunting occurs in some of these areas through potentially reduction of adult deer um, in one way or the other. So that is still the difficulty that we're having right now is having those larger kind of management level um, impact. And, you know, again, if you wanted to ever go on the website, we do have a lot of this stuff on there. So this is kind of our handout on transportation and disposal and importation. They do exist. Now for our surveillance and testing. So, um, surveillance in Wyoming has occurred since 1997. It did occur slightly before then, but kind of in different ways. Um, this program has been ongoing for more than 25 years. There's definitely been more than 79,000 samples tested. And this has largely been looking at hunter harvested, targeted and road killed animals. For us in our program, targeted just means any animal that is showing clinical signs of a disease or is found dead with no apparent cause. So that's when we're talking about targeted. The surveillance, surveillance program really has evolved over time. Um, where we're at right now though, is we're using a rotating five-year program. That means we're focusing surveillance on two to three deer and two to three elk herd units within um, each eight of the regional um, offices or areas each year. We're concentrating on hunter harvested animals and we're trying to target about 200 samples um, within one to three consecutive years. We do also test non-endemic areas being the feed grounds, but this is opportunistic, um, but we do get a lot of samples from those areas too. So folks do a tremendous job um, getting those in tests. Similar to brucellosis, we really are aiming for a program where we can have adequate sample size that we feel comfortable saying something about, but we also don't wanna squash our testing capacity and our folks in the lab. Again, think of the crying. The testing that we do, our lab is accredited for CWD diagnostics. Um, we mainly test retropharyngeal lymph nodes. We do test an obix if we can get it and it's you know in good condition. And we do also use tonsil, but that's uh, last resort typically. ELISA is the primary tool here. And then we do follow up with an IHC or immunohistochemistry. Um, this is a confirmatory test when necessary. Think um, if we found it in a new area. Results are now available online for folks to look them up. And typically it takes less than three weeks from when the sample makes it to the lab. I'll say these folks in the lab are amazing. Um, typically these things are done within the week. Um, so they really do, you know, do a hell of a job um, getting the stuff back to folks so they can make appropriate decisions when needed. Um, and the testing is free. And as far as this year, taking a look, you know, at what we looked at from priority herd units and our mandatory hunt areas, um, this is for mule deer for 2023. So again, why? I mean, here we are. Um, our priority uh, herd units are these ones in yellow here. And then our mandatory sampling hunt areas are the ones in green. And as far as our elk are concerned, um, and we're only going to talk about priority herd units because we did not have any mandatory areas for elk, um, but they are all in yellow here. Now for our results, and this is where I become a real bummer again. Um, so I'm going to start with this year, um, or 2023, we had 5,100 samples submitted and tested for deer, elk, and moose. 
Um, 711 of those samples tested positive, so we're at about a 14% average overall for the state. Uh, we did identify three new deer hunt areas. So that's that top map up here in purple. Um, and here they are. And we also identified one national park uh, that is new for us too. So that's Yellowstone up here. One of the things before I go on to elk, just so you can see, but all these kind of lines through our hunt areas, that is denoting that we have a CWD endemic area that we picked up CWD um, previously in one of these areas. Um, you can see that there's a lot of them on here. So again, one of those, you know, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but I'm trying to tell you, deal with CWD now. Um, the other one on here is our elk map. Um, we did identify four new elk hunt areas. Those are in green. And it's kind of easier to kind of see that on this map, but here are our endemic elk hunt areas, again, with those lines through those areas. I'm going to show you a couple of the herds, um, you know, that folks talk about quite a bit because of the CWD prevalence. Um, and then I'll kind of give you just a general, you know, what kind of samples were submitted to us to give you an idea. But um, for us so far um, in 2023, we do have one of our herds that we're a little worried about, which is our Gray Bill, Gray Bull River herd. Um, and you can kind of see on here potentially why. One of the reasons, though, is I'm highlighting our kind of younger males. So these are the animals that are under five years of age. Um, we're getting pretty high here, I would say, at about 34.3%. We don't have a huge sample size, so I do want to like highlight that as well. Um, but it's just something to pick up on, because remember I said in the previous slide, we tend to think our older age males are the ones that typically have all the CWD. And then our other herd that we're concerned about is our project herd. Um, this one here, we have our adult male prevalence sitting at 65%. Um, and then we have our young males. Again, not a great sample size, right? This isn't huge, um, but it is higher than I think we expected or wanted. Um, and so I'm just kind of putting that out there. It seems that you know some of the things we thought about CWD are slowly shifting over. The samples that we received, um, I get a lot of questions about this too. Where do they come from? Um, how do you get your samples, et cetera, et cetera. The majority of them are coming from our excellent game and fish folks that are collecting them either through check stations, uh, getting out there, uh, also at our regional offices. So a lot of our folks are trained at collecting these samples. So if someone comes to the office, um, they will take that sample out or help folks do it themselves. The other group in here is our hunters. So um, about 11% of our samples comes directly from them. We've just started tracking that recently. So last year, this is actually up from 8%. Um, I can't really say, you know, year to year what made a big difference or not. Um, I do appreciate the work that our hunters do. Um, I, I think they really care about conservation. So I'm hoping this will increase with time um, because I think it really helps people kind of get involved and be part of something. And then as far as samples by surveillance category, um, the majority are coming from our hunter harvested samples and then targeted is kind of the second largest group there. Um, and then as far as positives for CWD, um, the largest group is from our hunter harvested submissions and then from our targeted submissions. So why do we care? Um, and we talked about this early on, we talked about this in brucellosis, why we care, but why would we care here for CWD? Why are we investing all this time and energy for something? Um, the first one being human health. There's still a lot of question marks here, right? So there's been lab studies done. Um, you know, we talk a lot about that substantial species barrier, but it's definitely not absolute. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. The other thing on here is the public health studies that are continuing to be done. So the CDC down here um, does a pretty big study looking at Colorado, Wyoming, and Wisconsin, and trying to show a link between human prion disease and ingestion of game meat. Um, there's not a ton of human prion disease, thank God. Uh, but, you know, I think these kinds of studies need time and a lot more submissions and samples to kind of see over time where we're going. The CDC and the WHO recommend that CWD positive animals are not consumed, and that's the same that we re recommend here at Wyoming Game and Fish. 
prions are not inactivated by cooking. And why would we like to push this? You know what I mean? Like, let's not push the boundaries and put us in a situation where one day that substantial species barrier is no longer there. The other reason why we care is every other reason we brought up on kind of one of those first slides, um, because we have alarming statistics, right? So 35 out of 37 of Wyoming's mule deer herds are infected with CWD. Um, you can see that really clearly on the slide here. I showed you CWD prevalence in that project herd. Our adult mule deer males are at 65%. Our adult mule deer females are at 28.3%. And then that Gray Bowl River herd for adult mule deers, our males are at 45.9% and our females are at 12.7%. Not to mention what I talked about before, which are some of the younger um, animals that are also kind of that prevalence is driving higher as time goes on. And generally, right, we care because CWD over time is changing our deer herds. Generally, we thought, right, CWD affects prime age animals only, but as that prevalence is increasing, these animals are becoming infected at a younger age. We care because CWD positive animals only are living potentially for two years, which means that average age of our herd is going to shift to younger animals and older animals are going to become rare, which is definitely the case for some of our herds here down in southeastern Wyoming. As our prevalence increases and more females become infected, and they are the foundation of the herd, reproduction, growth, and resilience of that herd is definitely constrained. So you're gonna have population declines over time. And prion disposition on the landscape increases with prevalence, right? So the higher prevalence, the higher you have prions in the environment, increasing the likelihood of disease transmission from the environment. And this is just all infectious disease generalities, right? Like this is disease ecology 101. If you have something that's impacting your herd's resiliency, um, you're going to have a more difficult time for that herd to deal with other changes that come their way, like other infectious diseases, habitat, or climate change. Your populations are just not going to bounce back you the way you think they should bounce back, um, even with time. So after all that and being a huge bummer, and now we're all really sad, I'll try and lighten it up a little bit with some you know bigger picture uh, takeaways here, you know, working in government, working on larger disease programs. One of the big ones here is wildlife health definitely is one health. Um, I'm not saying we get, forget about, I actually think in Wyoming, most folks do a really good job at including us when they have to, but just as a generality, um, as human population grows, we're going to have loss, loss of natural habitat. You know, think a little bit about that brucellosis situation. Our interactions are definitely increasing. I had a ton of domestic cow pictures in this PowerPoint. I had a ton of domestic cows and elk uh, pictures in this PowerPoint. We really all want the same thing. We want healthy populations, be it for humans, wildlife, domestic animals, the environment itself. You know, we all have the same goal in that. I really hope folks are getting to know what's circulating in their state, province, or territory, be it, you know, infectious disease or other major challenge to, you know, wildlife health. Please get to know your wildlife health experts. Um, we are a little weird, um, but it's definitely worth reaching out every once in a while. I think being integrative is the right way to go in a lot of these cases because funding, help, and ideas can all be shared. Um, and it, we're all trying to really do the same thing, but maybe just with a different lens. The other one on here is science is lame. Um, you know, that's my really cute way of saying that not everyone wants to hear the science behind why certain decisions are being made. Um, they might not care about that at all. We're trained to provide best available science. I know it can be really difficult to understand how others would not want to know that or flat out just not believe it. Um, as a bit of an example, I was tasked with presenting modeling to uh, of disease on feed grounds to the public. It went over about as well as you thought or think it would probably go over. Uh, I think we have to continue to present and share a best available science, continue to educate, continue to reach out as best we can. None of these things that we want to do that we think would be valuable um, will happen without public support. You might be able to make you know, a small change here, which is still good. I think that's valuable. But if you want to make large scale changes and if you want them to be really set in stone long term, we really need to get folks on board with it because they're the ones that are going to want this and push this forward. 
And this is just one of those things, you know, when I talk about science is lame, I like to bring up some fun emails. Sometimes I get from people that are a little spicy. Um, I like to read them, but you know, it can be hard sometimes to want to do a lot of this work when you are getting feedback from people thinking, do you really think, you know, you can do anything to stop or halt CWD? Um, I really hope we can. And I really hope we keep pushing that because I think together we'll come up with something good. And then finally, um, early detection. I think all you folks know that too, but you know, as we see, once it gets into a wildlife population, it's nearly impossible to eradicate. And I know sometimes this is much bigger than us, right? It's not, you know, something that we can potentially do, but if we can try to have early detection, if we can try to have those conversations, we can plan, we can have alternatives, we can identify things early, we can think about other things, you know, potentially thinking in other lenses than our own. Um, we're all adults, we're all a little sad. Why not be a little sadder with some compromising between different groups too, right? Anyways, that is it for me. I think I'm right at the end there. I really appreciate everyone listening to me. Um, if you do have questions and comments, please reach out. My email is on there. Um, if you want to yell at me for something, I have a different email address and it is martin.hicks at wyo.gov. And that will definitely come to me at some point, I'm sure. Thanks. Sam, if you have a minute, uh, Rachel did ask what your definition of endemic is. CWD? Uh, that's a good question. Right now we're using endemic as if we have found CWD in an area, we're considering that area now has CWD and endemic. The terms are different than some folks would potentially use. And it's definitely one of the things we're probably going to have to change a little bit going forward, especially for some of our other programs. But for now, that's what it is. Thanks so much. That was super interesting. I'll just give it a minute if anyone has any questions and you have time to answer them. Otherwise, this was really great and I hope everyone learned something. Okay, so Larissa says, great presentation. You discussed having continuing difficulties garnering support for ongoing CWD management actions. Wondering if you have any advice or approaches to gain public support that have worked or not worked in Wyoming. That's a really good question, Larissa. Um, so I think from my perspective, and it's not always the greatest perspective because I'm not always in the field. Um, I think that trying to reach out to the public and just general education, like constantly being available and doing that is one of those ways you can garner support. I think trying to hit some of those bigger you know, the folks, you, you definitely, there are people in different communities, right, that are kind of the leaders and they're potentially the most outspoken. Um, trying to get some of those folks educated and potentially acting as ambassadors for some of these programs, I think can help too. Um, I think putting your messaging in some like quick, easy format. So I know everyone watches TikTok, TikTok. See, that's how good I know these things, but TikToks, um, having that like easily digestible that can potentially help people too. Um, I have a lot of my own thoughts on why maybe there's a little bit of a disconnect in some cases as we're going forward, but I'm happy to kind of, you know, if you wanted to talk, Larissa, I can go more and more into it. But those are some just of the general stuff that we do on our end to try and garner um, some support for our programs. That's awesome. Thanks, Sam. Well, maybe I'll end it here. You've left your contact info, or if people email me, I can always pass on, you know, further questions to you as well. So thanks very much for your excellent presentation today. And yeah, thanks everyone for attending and being in such a good audience.